So the following podcast comes from the Embodiment Conference about two years ago now. Um, so it was a really great conference, by far the biggest of its kind, thousand speakers, about half a million people attending. Um, it was at a really delicate time with COVID and various other things happening in the world. And we just think it was a huge gift to the world. The whole team worked incredibly hard to put the conference on. Um, you know, we've decided that it's really good to share some of the some of the sessions from the conference to everyone. So we put a few of them out on a podcast. Um, so here's one of those. So if you hear references, you know, it sound like that, but that's where it's from. And we think the content still really stands up. So enjoy this session. Juan, it's my pleasure again to receive Jeff, Jeff Brown uh, today. So Jeff Brown is author, teacher, and real man activist and grounded spiritualist. Uh, so Jeff has been studied bioenergetics, practice body center psychotherapy. He has an MA in psychology, but what happened is most important is his inner work. Um, so from there, he has been connected to his spirituality with his emotional life and learned very important lesson. And that's what we'll talk about today. Uh, since 2015, he opened Soul Shaping Institute, and the school will soon expand to include the offerings of other authors and teachers. So welcome, Jeff. Welcome today. Thank you, Stephanie. It's good to be with you and everybody else. Thank you. Uh, so today, we would like to talk about uh, the book, your book, Grounded Spirituality, where he meets why. And... Um, what we'd like to talk about today is finding your presence and purpose before it's too late. So Jeff, what is for you embodied presence? Um, I think for me, it's where a greater number of threads of my consciousness are activated and be ex and experienced through the body itself. Um, I went through a number of phases when I was over activating certain threads of consciousness, um, sometimes a bypassing dissociative consciousness, sometimes a head tripping consciousness. Um, sometimes I was living primarily only through my hips at other times, primarily only through voice and expression. Um, the term I use is enrealment and grounded spirituality that my experience through my somatic journey has been that the more that I open the container, clear the emotional debris that's obstructing my consciousness, um, the fragments start to work together and become a more holy or inclusive weave. Um, and I experience this moment, this notion of presence um, as an enrealed or inclusive experience. So in other words, more of me is here for this experience. My journey with spirituality, this thing we call spirituality, which I've come to believe is more of what I would call patriarchal or disembodied or dissociated spirituality, was that I was being led in the direction of only accessing certain threads of the weave. And I was dissociating from or detaching from those uncomfortable experiences of embodiment. And somatic psychotherapy and working with Al Lowen originally and, and Stan Groff's holotropic breath work uh, helped me to understand that if I could go deeper into the cavern and break through the armor and the holdings, I began to experience myself and myself in relation to this moment in a completely different way. Yeah. So if we can maybe focus a little bit more on what you were saying is that you have a specific vision on um, maybe meditation or different practice and spirituality, right? If you can tell us a little bit more around that. Right. So, so on my journey, which I made a film called Carmageddon, which was in many ways the beginning of this journey. Um, and I think grounded spirituality was the culmination of the journey. What I came to understand was that for me, my most profound experiences of presence came through my body. Not my body as a construct, not my body only in yogic functioning, not my body only as dancer, not my body only as lover, but my body in all ways. Um, and when I focused on spiritual, traditional spiritual practices, for the most part, it was helpful as a first stage of awakening. I would get access to or a glimpse of 
say, a more expansive or unified consciousness. So it gave me an experience of relief in many ways, but it didn't give me an experience of resolution. So I spent some time with some of Tolle's work in Power of Now, a book that I now call The Power of Self-Avoidance, because for me, what I came to realize is that was just baby steps. That was the first stage of awakening or the first stage of a sleepening, depending on how you look at it. Witnessing the pain body was only the beginning of the journey for me. It was like a surgeon looking at the wound. Looking at the wound didn't heal or resolve the wound and didn't ignite adequate transformation. So I came to realize through all of these experiences, my time with Ram Das, who wrote Be Here Now, but who in many ways I didn't feel was here. He had changed his name. There were ways in which I felt like he wasn't owning his psycho-emotional material as part of his spiritual practice. I confronted him on that. He acknowledged he was a bypasser. So my journey has been really about trying to sort through this thing, they patriarchal spirituality and the new cage movement and pseudo non-duality, what they call the Advaita movement, what I call the Avoida movement is calling spirituality and awakening because my experience was their practices didn't get me anywhere. But the work that I did with Al Lowen and Stan Groff's holotropic breath work, where I went deep inside of this uncomfortably armored body and energized and excavated the words and the feelings that needed to be moved and expressed, brought me far more into an experience, an integrated, sustained experience of this thing called unity consciousness than sitting still on a meditation cushion ever did. For me, all of the practices, not so much the practice, but the philosophy behind patriarchal spirituality, which is that your localized story isn't really you. Your feelings are illusions. Your personal identifications are essentially false. Your ego has to be destroyed and dissolved. Your mind is really to blame for everything, which is utterly preposterous. All of this just started to feel to me, this splitting off of humanness from spirituality as a dissociative construct, as self-avoidance masquerading as enlightenment. I think it's just men, started with men who don't want to own their stuff, which almost every woman who's been in a relationship with a man knows about. Um, And I wasn't, I was more interested in having an experience of wholeness through my body, just organically, because I had that in my childhood and held on tightly for as long as I could. And what I simply found was that that way of bypassing reality and calling that awakening was just a lie. Um, so let, maybe I could read a quick quote from Grounded Spirituality sure. on this topic, right? Because I think that fixation, their fixation on the mind, witnessing the mind for 20 hours a day in the meditation stupor, the illusion of the mind being the problem is part of the game. You're not gonna resolve all these problems by staying inside of the mind but they like it there because they don't want to drop down into the body. Um, This is a quote. Um, Hey, one second. Ah, here it is. Monkey mind quote. Okay. The primary cause of our unhappiness is not our thoughts. The monkey mind is not the source of our anxiety. It's a symptom of it. Forget the monkey mind. The mind is not the enemy. Unhealed pain is. Men have been blaming the mind for their neurosis for centuries while deftly avoiding that which sources its maladies, somatic constrictions, and unprocessed emotions stored in the body itself. It's like looking for your keys somewhere in the house. Sorry, it's like losing your keys somewhere in the house and looking for them in the car. Useless, useless, useless. Until they stop blaming the mind and recognize that its neurosis stem from the unresolved emotional and physical body, there'll be no liberation. Shifting out of unhappiness is not a cerebral process. That's just another ineffective band-aid. It's a visceral, full-body experience. It's the monkey heart that's the issue. The state of inner turbulence and agitation that emanates from an unclear heart. The more repressed your emotional body, the more repetitive your thoughts. Flooded with unhealed emotions and unexpressed truths, the monkey heart jumps from treetop to treetop, emoting without grounding, dancing in its confusion. Often misinterpreted as a monkey mind, the monkey heart is reflected in repetitive thinking, perpetual anxiety, and negative imaginings, all of which are emanating from the emotional and physical body. So I would go see Alexander Lowen when he was alive. I'd take this 10-hour train ride down from Toronto to Connecticut. When I stand outside of his house before walking into this place that he worked, this dank, dirty old room that he worked in that was just like reflected, embodied unconsciousness. It was fantastic. 
you know, he would, he was inside of a horse farm. His house was right inside of a horse farm. It was vital and beautiful. And, but I, I felt myself as a separate being. There was a horse farm. There was the house. There was this thing called Jeff. I'd go into Al's office. The dog would be there. The bird would be chirping. He'd come in bright eyed and bushy tailed like true spirituality. Like I could feel him. I could feel his purpose. I could feel his vitality. He wasn't just like an automaton esque meditator. He was vital. That felt like awakening to me. He would take me into my body in all kinds of scary and uncomfortable ways. I would discharge in all kinds of scary and uncomfortable ways. At the end of it, I would walk out of his office and I experienced myself in a unified consciousness. And all of that happened in the heart of the somatic psychology experience, all of it. I could never get anywhere close to that sitting still in a meditation cushion. I knew why we emphasize stillness and silence. Men didn't want to deal with noise and movement because it brought up all their triggers, right? So they crafted this cave-like experience of being lost on the cushion for hours and hours. In 30 or 40 minutes without low one, I could do more than I, I could accomplish in 20 years on a meditation cushion. And that was, that was all the experience I needed to understand that what I was looking for in terms of spirituality really had to come through my body. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so again, if we can a little bit emphasize, because it's, it's a really spe a specific word you're using, grounded spirituality. Hmm. So what is grounded spirituality for you? Like I need to find the definition. It's a lot better than the definition. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> I mean, let me just say without finding the definition, it'll take too long. Um, for me, it's, it's that my experience was that it, everything started from my feet up. So the more rooted I am in my body, the more I can feel my feet, the more I can feel my connection to Mother Earth, the more I can feel my connection to my localized self, to my localized responsibilities, the more I feel connected to the world horizontally, not vertically, because that just feels dissociative to me, uh, the more I feel like I am having an embodied experience. So for me, spirituality means reality. So the most spiritual person is the one who is encompassing the broadest number of weaves of the human experience. So being a master meditator means you may be masterful at a particular thread or practice. My experience is that I wanted to be in all threads of consciousness. And the only way I could have that experience and sustain that experience had to begin with being grounded on Mother Earth. Because when I had those experiences or explored those awakened experiences in an ungrounded state of being, they felt like fleeting flight, flights, flights of fancy. They felt momentary. They felt like glimpses, um, not sustainable and not concrete and actually not as expansive as my experiences were when I accessed something expansive from a rooted perspective. Yeah, absolutely. Um, can we go as well to, because you mentioned it, what is called spiritual bypass? Because I'm not sure like everyone knows what it is about. So let me read. So this is a John Wellwood term that was, he coined this apparently in the 90s um, in, or in, in 1984 mm -hmm. to describe turning to spirituality in an effort to rise above personal challenges and difficult emotions. Spirit becomes a crutch rather than the expression of a natural unfolding. So in other words, you turn to that. Now it's in, I'll talk a bit more about it, but you turn to this thing called spirituality in an effort to get away from or avoid your unresolved issue, which in my view is most of what we've been calling spirituality. It's a bifurcation between spirituality and humanness on every level, as opposed to having an embodied experience of spirituality that starts within your localized self feet grounded on mother earth. So then when you move in the direction of a more expansive consciousness, there's actually a self there to stand in the heart of that experience. And for me, those are two very, very different experiences. The bypass experience is, um, it's, it is fleeting, but it's also not as complete an experience because you're actually not in the localized self and standing in the heart of that. And for me, the work is to come back down to earth. I'm not opposed to having an experience of something called unity consciousness or something called non-duality. But if we're not doing that from the heart of an integrated, woven, um, work through self, then there's actually nobody there to have that experience. Yeah. And um, another thing that um, I've heard from you is 
uh, talking about a spiritual, spirituality bypass is um, in, in our field of embodiment sometimes or meditation is uh, people not being able to criticize any teacher. Yes. So, so the game that the game that they played is this, it's very simple. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's a very Trumpian game. And, you know, for me, Trump and Tolle are a very similar bifurcated consciousness. And the game is simply that by splitting off spirituality from humanists, by claiming that your story, your personality, your feelings aren't real or true, the guru could get away with anything. So the guru could sleep with every single person in the crowd. And then all he had to say was, that wasn't really me, my absolute self, that was my persona or my personality. Um, and then they create a number of different rules. No gossiping, no judgment, no anger. These are control methods, right? So that you couldn't actually activate the part of you that intuitively knew that there was something wrong with this entire system. Then they clothe themselves in all kinds of garb. They rely on this thing called lineage. They have new and unique and interesting language from the spiritual texts. And those of us who are often trauma survivors, who are more prone to Godjectifying other, are then inclined to believe that that becomes our symbol of good daddy or good mommy or God self. And we're willing to withstand any behavior that they do because they've set it up so that they are the authority, the unquestionable authority, the unquestioned authority, uh, and they can essentially get away from murder. This is the game. We see this in the unconscionable capitalist world. We see this in the way the media works us. We see this in the way that we're being worked in social media now, that they want to turn us into somebody without a voice. Because if we have a voice, we're going to stand against that which we know intuitively is wrong. And I think that's how this whole system has been constructed. So, so you know, when Eckhart sits, this is what happened to me. I was read Power of Now at first, and I thought, well, I love this, you know? He tells this really cool story about how he was suicidal, and, and then all of a sudden, one morning, he woke up, and he was, like, enlightened, and I thought, I want a piece of that, you know? Um, and he sat on park benches for two years in a state of bliss. He said, I want to sit on park benches in a state of bliss for two years. That's wonderful. And then I started to engage in the practices I started to feel more like an automaton. I started to feel more neutralized, more neuterized, less vital, less feeling. Based. And I liked it in a way because I, I didn't have to deal with my triggers as much. I didn't have to get too close to anybody. All of a sudden I could convince myself I was awakened and enlightened. But then the moment I went back into the world and engaged in relationship, participated in anything that activated my body, I was like, this is the biggest load of bullshit ever. It's like, I get it. It's self-avoidance masquerading as enlightenment. You want some relief, go have your relief, but don't call your relief enlightenment. Don't play that game. That's misleading people because if enlightenment exists at all, you have to be there for all of it. Every part of you has to be there. Presence is a whole body and a whole being experience. And that was not a whole body experience. So, once I began to activate, again, I realized that if I didn't find a way to take this first stage of awakening, which was the glimpse into a unified field through these practices, back inside of my localized self, then, and work the alchemy and find the alchemical weave that I hadn't actually found anything at all, other than a, a moment of relief, a year of relief, a lifetime of relief. But detachment is a tool, it's not a life. And I really, really wanted a life not just an attached, detached experience. Yeah. Um, so what would be spirituality for you? So I define spirituality as reality. So for me, the most spiritual person, if we could momentarily quantify it, is the one who's in the greatest number of weaves of reality, not the one who's perfected the transcendent realms, whatever, the, if that even exists. Not the one who says they found the absolute self, but the one who's here for all of this. So I'm connected to a more unified lens of the all oneness field. I'm also inside of my body. I can feel my body and sensations. I feel my feet making contact. I feel my heart beating. I'm connected to my emotions and feelings and taking them seriously, not shaming and shunning them and turning my story around like Byron Katie. Um, I'm honoring and developing the healthy ego rather than throwing the whole ego out with the bath water. Um, I'm understanding that my mind is a tool that serves my soul's callings in many ways. It's wonderfully functional and helpful in those ways, but it doesn't get to rule the roost. It doesn't get to direct my path in my life. 
Um, I'm aware of my practical responsibilities. I'm aware of the political landscape I live in. I'm holding as much of that as possible. For me, that's real spirituality, not bifurcated, linear, limited spirituality, not patriarchal spirituality. It's more aligned with the divine feminine approach, I think, to spirituality, where your body is really, really the determiner um, of your experience. It comes through the body, the localized self, and you honor the localized self. So instead of dissing my story and claiming that my personal identifications are all false, you acknowledge the fact that some of your personal identifications aren't truly you, like whatever you were told you are by nasty mommy or daddy, but you also understand that your story is your glory and that you will find your true path and purpose. So this may be now we can talk about the here and the why through the body, through the localized self. So I don't want to dishonor my booby and my Zeta, my grandparents who put food on the table and got me chicken soup and gave me all the love my parents couldn't give me by saying that none of that is real, none of that is true. And there's an absolute self that exists independent of that. Well, that's just absolute bullshit in my opinion. Um, I want to honor that lineage to the extent that it's worthy of being honored um, and to find my story in the human continuum in the collective continuum. Um, and the connection for me and the reason why all of this matters for me is that it wasn't enough for me just to get here. I mean, what are we talking about? What is an embodiment conference? We're talking about getting here, right? What does it mean to be here? So patriarchal spirituality will tell you this pseudo non-dual bullshit is what it means to be here. And my body says that's not true. There's another version of here, which is more encompassing, more inclusive. That's what I wanted. And I didn't just want to get here for the sake of pondering my navel more effectively. I wanted to get here because I wanted to have a why. It didn't make sense to me that I was just getting here so I could just be here. Um, because in my experience, I had all kinds of indicators of encoded path coming through my embodied experience at an early age. I saw a famous criminal lawyer in Canada named Eddie Greenspan. I'd see him on TV. I said, I'm going to work with that guy one day. I know that guy. Um, that guy feels like part of my future. I knew I was going to study psychology, humanistic psychology. When I read Maslow, my body, I had what I called truth chills, as opposed to truth aches, which are indicators you're on the wrong path, on false path. I had so much of that happening in me. So I was like, okay, so the more I get here, the more I clear my debris, the more access I have immediately to why I'm here. I would clear my debris with Alexander Lowen, and then the writer would come up and say, it's almost time to write. This was in the bones of my being. It wasn't a concept. It wasn't something I wished for. It was in my body. Um, serendipity, synchronicity, all of it that happened more often when I cleared the debris and opened the channels in my body. There was more space inside to recognize my path and more energy now to activate and do the thing that I was called to do. So for me, particularly in the world we're living in right now, where we're at risk as a species, let's own that. If we don't link the here, the embodiment work to the why, presence to purpose, we haven't accomplished anything. Because trauma is not the end of the story, it's the beginning of the story. The purpose of the trauma work is to clear the emotional debris so we can actually access presence in a way that then helps us to recognize our purpose. Uh, and once we find our sacred purpose, which for me writing was one of my elements of sacred purpose, all the emotional work I did was also part of it, right? Um, at this stage of the collective, so much of our sacred purpose is about doing the traumatic work. When we find our unique and distinct path of purpose and all the stages and forms of it, it then becomes a portal back to presence. So if I can activate as a writer, if I can get free inside of that experience, it brings me back into the moment, a more deeply inclusive way. And when I can come more deeply and inclusively into my body in terms of real presence, uh, it then opens the portal and tells me the next stage on my path to purpose. So I'm working on a model now that will be ready in the new year that's really trying to bring together the here and the why so that we're not just getting here for no good reason. We're getting here so we can activate and energize. We're built to move. We're built to produce. We're built, we're built to bring offering and gift to the world. Um, and I think without that, all of this embodiment work is kind of a bit of a waste of time because we're all getting wonderfully embodied. And meanwhile, the planet is burning and we're not doing anything about it. Yeah. Absolutely. So um, is there anything you can tell us a little bit more again about embodiment and purpose? Because um, there's always a lot of people who, who would like to have a purpose, but might be a little bit lost in the way. So is there anything you could suggest? Um, yeah. Practically. 
Yeah, I mean, I, in grounded spirituality, I have some tools, um, various meditations, but activated meditations that they can engage in if they want to. But I think that, that at this stage of human development, I think somatic psychotherapies and holotropic breath work, and even Osho's dynamic meditation, if you do it without his obsession with the witnessing components, um, are essential tools to clear this individual, ancestral, generational, and collective emotional debris that is obstructing our capacity to be present and in the moment. Um, this is the work we have to do now. So somatic experiencing, bioenergetics, core energetics, TRE, there's many more. Uh, Lydia Becker is doing scan therapy. You can find her online with Google. There are a number of people, I'm sure you're one of them and Mark as well, who are developing models and getting into the heart of this experience to help people to essentially clear the debris that's obstructing their presence and their consciousness. And so when people ask me, what do I do to find my path and purpose? That's the first thing I tell them to do because I was very unusual. I had glimpses of path and purpose as a teenager. I have no idea why it may have been because I cried my way and tantrumed my way through childhood. So to a certain degree and up to a certain age, I had a fair amount of clarity and presence and I felt more inclusive and not defended and armored in my consciousness. And then I got armored after that. Um, but I think that clearing of the debris that going against the grain and insisting, I had it in my mind at a very early age and in my body that my mother was trying to imprison me inside of her consciousness. I got that. So I kept crying. I kept raging against the machine. I kept releasing. So for a long time, I had an experience of coming back to freshness of appreciation. When you come back to that feeling, unencumbered feeling in your body, I believe that's where you're going to find glimpses of path and purpose. So trying to think it through, getting in those thought loops where you're asking yourself repeatedly if you should be with that partner or where you should live or what you should do, it's not going to get you very far. You have to find a way to get inside of the body and then the body will yield the fruits of that labor by telling you what the next step on your path is. Because if you can't connect with the body, you can't connect with the intuitive knowing. And if you can't connect with the intuitive knowing, you're not going to get the information you need as to where to step next. Mm, absolutely. Um, you know, I was talking with Laura Davis, work on intuition and uh, with Margaret just before. How do you find for you your intuition? How does it physically feel for you? So you, because you mentioned like you knew sometimes where you had to go. So is there anything that can give us an idea on how does it manifest? to sense that it's your right direction to go. How does the intuition manifest? Yes. In How does your it body. show itself as knowing, you mean? Yes. Yeah, I think through the body. I mean, so, you know, this, I developed this notion, notion of truth aches, which are indications usually in the body or in your behavior that you're not living true to path, what I might call true path or soul scriptures or sacred purpose. You call it whatever you want. Um, and the corollary of that, the other side of that, was what I call truth chills. So there's a feeling you have in your body, you get chills, when you know something is true for you. If we're not in our bodies, if we're floating above our bodies, if we're head tripping our way through life as a survival tactic, it's going to be very hard for us to access that knowing. Um, and in a culture that prizes, as patriarchy does, the mind over the body, because the body is like, filled with emotional contaminants they don't want anything to do with, it's understandable that people have no idea what their intuition is telling them. So again, you have to go back and do the work to clear the debris and open up the lines and come back into an inclusive consciousness in the body itself. There's so much cultural emphasis on inclusivity and it's beautiful, but if we don't get inclusive in relation to the self itself, we're never going to be meaningfully inclusive outside of ourselves. And I think when you do that, you start to get into contact with this thing called intuition that talks to you through your body and talks to your mind. So I, I know the difference between my mind trying to tell me there's a directionality and my that's not connected to the body's intuitive knowing. And I know when the body's intuitive knowing is communicating with my mind. And I know this is a writer. So if I sit down with an idea of something I should write that's coming from my mind, um, it's not alive. You know, it's just not alive. I mean, I can punch my way through it. It'll be okay. But if I'm drawn at three in the morning when I can't sleep by words that are ready to be written and expressed, 
I always invariably know that's coming from my intuitive body telling me this is the next thing on my list that needs to be expressed and explored. And it's a completely different, it's a felt experience. Um, and, and you get truth chills. There's just a feeling in the body of aliveness, a giddiness, uh, um, Alexander Lowenian, bright eyed and bushy tailed experience that tells you that this is right and true for you. Um, and in a culture that's been telling us, shaming us and shunning us and making us generic so they can construct a manipulative structure to make money from and lead us in the direction they want. It's very hard for many of us to come into contact with this. I, I had a cousin who used to sit with me for hours and kept saying, I don't know if I should stay with her. I don't know where I should live. I don't know if this is the right job for me. Uh, and I'd say, well, how do you feel? And he'd say, well, I think, and I said, well, that's the problem. Your mind, you've, you've been, you've done this loop forever. If it worked, you wouldn't have to be asking me these questions now, two and a half years later, like really at some point you're going to have to find the courage and find the right practitioner because that's important to go down inside of the cavern and find the answers that live inside of your bones. And it's, that's what it's all about is coming into the body and the heart and opening the lines and, and then intuition is just there waiting. And then you refine it. And you, I mean, I talk about depth charges a lot. I think it's important if you're at a stage in your consciousness where you're not clear yet as to why you're here, it's okay. That's most people. You want to develop a depth charge consciousness where you're going into experiences that are uncomfortable, but that will crack through the armor, the emotional and physical armor. And if you do that, you will start getting information from your body and your bones as to what path you're here to walk. What James Hillman called the innate image. It's inside your body. You don't know that now, but the farther you go and the deeper you go, the more true and clear you're going to be. And then the more information you're going to get so at this point in my life, I experienced myself like a car on a highway that, and there's like off ramps and every off ramp tells me the next thing I'm supposed to do on my sacred purpose path. So either I get off the ramp and do it and then get back on the highway and the next one unfolds. That may not happen at first, but after a number of years of honing this thing, true, false, real, unreal, authentic, inauthentic, spiritual, not spiritual, it starts to happen for you. And then you are flooded with directionality, path and purpose, with a degree of clarity more and more all the time. And that then be, can, be, becomes the thing that really dominates your directionality in your life. It all happens in the body. It all happens in the body. None of this is a construct. None of this is a cerebral concept. You know, my path is, you can make practical decisions from your mind as a survivalist, it's fine. But authenticity is not something that arises in the heart of your thinking it arises really in the heart of your feeling. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, just before I go to the questions, um, why do you think it's so important to do it? And you mentioned in your title yeah. to do the work before it's too late. Because, because this, uh, this disembodied species is doing horrifying damage to the planet. We have a burning planet uh, and really almost all of it is coming because we're not in our bodies. We're not here for the experience. The classic image is the 2012 John Cusack movie poster image when there's a bunch of monks on top of a mountain in their monkey world and the, as, you know, kind of in a state of serenity or equ pseudo equanimity, whatever that game is they're playing and the waves are coming over the mountaintops. And I'm like, okay, big shots. You got it all worked out. You're ready for the next lifetime. Are you really ready for the next lifetime? Because you're just about to die because you're so busy pondering your fucking navel. You're not actually doing anything to help this species to stop destroying itself and its capacity to live on this planet. We, I mean, if Trump isn't an indicator of how dangerous it is for us now, nothing is. It, it is absolutely desperately necessary for us to get in our bodies and activate our path and our purpose um, before we destroy our capacity to live on this planet. Perfect. So, uh, Jeff, um, is, are you okay to go with the questions from the yeah. participant? They've been quite into the conversation. So, um, okay. one that actually I've been talking with a lot of speakers uh, recently, from Geraldine, who say, do you think that drug-induced spiritual experiences have that as risk, that I might not be able to stand in the experience with a localized self? 
So what do you think about that kind of? That's a big question. So, uh, so I, I'm not a drug guy, um, partly because I have a Jewish liver, but also because um, I've always believed that I could access all of this in the heart of my embodied experience. Um, so when I did my first holotropic breathwork at the Omega Institute with Terry Hunt, I went places that were, I mean, I was a pragmatic lawyer guy at that stage. I hadn't fully left law. I was shocked and startled by where I went visiting family of origin, deceased family of origin um, people, my Auntie Tilly's voice that I hadn't heard or thought of in decades, um, ac accessing elements of path and purpose in the heart of that intensified breath experience. And I had a very similar experience when I did the inside and opening workshop with Stan Groff and Jack Cornfield uh, many years ago. And not with Jack. Jack didn't do a thing for me, but Stan Groff's holotropic breath work did. I accessed a deeper levels of path and purpose. So I'm not really interested in doing it through some artificial means. Um, and I think it's very dangerous because we don't really understand. And this is true in the in the traditional medical world as well, because we don't understand the relationship with, between particular drugs and people's blood chemistry. We don't really understand how particular livers respond to different things. I think it's physically dangerous. Many people have done ayahuasca and died soon thereafter from that experience. I also think it's psychologically deadly dangerous. Um, I think people need to be very careful. There's a lot of people who don't even, and people are making a lot of money at this now, who are not trained in it and who don't understand. Somebody wrote me a few years ago, I put up a post and maybe I'll put it up again on Facebook on my page. Um, she wrote me about her brother. And her brother had, was semi-suicidal and he had gone down to the Amazon and done an ayahuasca phase and then another. And it gave him a little high, a little feeling of hope, a little, all of that. Um, and then eventually his material collapsed back into him because it had never really gone anywhere. And he had really given up on his psych psychotherapeutic process and his therapist and stopped taking them seriously as many of those drug people do and as many new cage people do. Um, and then the material comes back to haunt them, but on a much more intense level and they no longer have support structures to help them. And he committed suicide. And she attributed this really to his ayahuasca experience. So I think we just need to be very, very careful with this. And I would like to see a world that invites people to do this through the breath itself. Um, it feels safer, more organic, more genuine and authentic if it's handled properly. Um, and then people don't get peak experiences into some other way of being that actually may not be real and is really hard to sustain in the heart of localized life. Yeah. Um, okay. Someone asked, uh, actually, uh, my assistant, Sarah, <laughs> question, like, what practices worked for you to be grounded? So I think you already, like, answered that part. Um, but I say, she also asked, does healing always need a companion? So I guess, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I, a companion as in a therapeutic companion. I That's why I understand. Yes, absolutely. No, no, I don't think it does. I mean, I, I was a lone wolf warrior. So I would go often in the talk stages of therapy. I would go there to ground my perspective, get a little insight into my perspective but I was really fundamentally a deep worker. I couldn't do it all myself. I needed a therapist, for example, to introduce the term boundaries to me. You know, that took me days to assimilate, weeks to assimilate that word. So it was helpful and important. Um, but, but I think in terms of the somatic piece, I think that's where it was more important for me to have a practitioner. I needed Alexander Lowen to see my defenses, to talk to me for 15 minutes and knew I needed that first I, and knew how to usher me carefully in the right transference between me and him at the right moment into doing embodied work and knew how to hold the space and fortify that for me so that I could have an experience that I would never have otherwise known how to have. Um, and at the end of it, realized that this was a path that allowed me to access presence in a way that nothing ever had before, at least in my adult life. So, I think it depends where you're at in the process, but I think if you're wanting to get inside of the body and clear debris, you probably need to find a good practitioner who has tools and techniques that your defenses will never allow you to find all on your own. Yeah. Um, another question uh, from Lubna. As a trauma survivor, I lost sense of self and purpose that I have fostered pre-trauma. 
does the purpose I had pre-trauma still exist? Or do I have to find a new purpose and a new sense of self? What do you think? Fantastic question. Um, I mean, I think if the purpose is truly fundamental to what I would call your soul scriptures, like your reasons for being in this life that you were birthed with, you came into being, you incarnated with, I think it's probably still there. Uh, sometimes we then have traumatic experiences that inform us that our purpose is moving in another direction for a period of time. That is our purpose is to work through that material. And sometimes we then want to bring certain work into the world, as many psychotherapists know, who started working inside of their own trauma and then realized they now had done enough work within the self. They now wanted to bring these insights and wisdoms to the world outside of them. And so, you know, I, I think that, so for example, I had glimpses of being a writer early on. And then I realized I had work to do in the emotional body before I could be. So I would sit down and try to write, but I couldn't write because I needed to clear more emotional debris. And I needed to devote enough, enough years to that to do at least just enough work to then be able to sit down and do the writing that I was called to do. So it never went away. It's just I wasn't ready for that yet. Um, you know, if you step on the right path at the wrong time, you've stepped on the wrong path. I said in soul shaping. So it's probably still there, but maybe something else has to happen first. Perfect. So a lot of people are asking about a suggestion on how to find the right practitioner. That's yeah, well, I mean, that's, that's <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think this is a, that's a, we could spend a week talking about that. But yeah. I mean, I think this is one of the great problems is that if you're not at a stage where you're connected to your intuitive knowing, you may not be able to hear the part of you that says this is not the right therapeutic fit for me. So I think it's helpful to slow down the process, even at that moment when you most need help, to interact with a number of possible practitioners, to have conversations with them, to meet with them, to watch them on YouTube if they have videos, and allow yourself to come down into your body and ask yourself what your intuition is telling you. I worked with some bioenergetics people that were not for me. I worked with a woman in Toronto. She was wonderful to talk to, but I had no interest in going into my body with her. My body just said no. I walked in the room with Lowen, who I had very good Jewish grandfather transference to. He reminded me of my grandfather, but my more conscious grandfather. And I just felt absolutely comfortable being yelled at by him, told what to do. I trusted him. And so you want to find somebody you have good transference to and also somebody that you sense has real integrity in the way that they operate. Uh, solid boundaries, you know, nothing sticks to them. And that they have gone down the road. They're not talking about the road, but they've gone down the road. And the only way you're going to know that experientially is by listening to your body. So moving carefully, take your time, just like in any healthy relationship process, practice the art of selective attachment um, and, you know, have a number of inquiries and experiences with people till you find the one that really feels like the person for you at that moment in time. And also be allow, allow yourself, as I did, to shed therapists along the way. You may reach a stage where you developmentally outgrow that therapist or you need a technique that they don't engage in. Allow yourself to say goodbye to that therapist in the healthiest way possible and then move on to the next therapist on your path. Um, another question. There's a lot of interesting question. <laughs> Um, would also, uh, well, Richie would like, would love to know any path to finding your purpose or calling in life for someone in midlife six that is stuck in life. Yes. Um, uh, I mean, I do, I do have sacred purpose, uh, courses like on jeffbrown.co and at soul shipping Institute, they can engage in if they want to, um, But, but I, I think maybe the thing to do apart from whatever therapeutic work needs to do, you need to do to be able to access the information as to your directionality that's in your body is to depth charge, is to allow yourself to explore anything you're curious about, um, to get information from your lived experience, live your life like a laboratory of, ex of exploration and expression and expansion and have an experience. You know, if you're interested in exploring being a stained glass art smith person go and do that um if you're interested in dating people that are quite different from your usual pattern of relationship do that um allow yourself to turn upside down your normal notions of self 
and explore other ways of being in order to get information from your lived experience as to what your path and purpose is. I mean, we have often in this world a very limited habitual range of emotion. Uh, we operate within a very limited container of kind of exploration and safety, chaos and order. So I think sometimes you have to allow yourself to push beyond that habitual range of emotion and explore things outside of that cage in order to get information. Because if you're confused as to directionality from within the cage, that tells you that you have to expand the container. So expand the container and allow yourself to have other experiences that will give you information as to what direction you're here to go. Yeah. All right. Um, Deborah is asking, when we're trying to connect with our pain in an embodiment practice, how can we discern an healthy stop point for that moment in time versus an habitual defense pattern that we should maybe try to push past? Well, I think, I think that's, that's what a question. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I think that there is a tendency sometimes, and it depends on the practitioner. You want to work with the right practitioner who can help you to identify when you're stopping because of unhealthy resistance or when you're stopping because of healthy resistance. When I worked with low and I could go only so far, I went farther than I'd ever gone, but I knew there was a point where it was enough and you have to learn that in yourself and you have to be able to engage in that conversation with a practitioner. Some practitioners will push you. They're pushers. Uh, you don't want to work with a pusher unless you need a pusher. You also don't want to work with somebody who's too soft and non-assertive if you're someone who needs a little push. I mean, this is part of the process of depth charging and having experiences with various practitioners and deciding how far to go, you know, because it is dangerous. If you get pushed beyond resistance, that's healthy resistance, that's re-traumatizing. Um, but at the same time, if you don't get pushed when you actually need a push, then you're just going to stay stuck in the same habitual range of emotion that hasn't been gratifying for you. So you got to find the right practitioner and you've got to make the conversation around your resistance part of the moment to moment interaction so that it's understood that so much of this process is about the distinction between healthy resistance and unhealthy resistance. Yeah. That's the process. Mm -mm. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's a very important thing to think about and talk about. Mm -mm. Uh, maybe last question uh, from Paul, uh, which says, how do we develop self-acceptance when there are things we do not like about ourselves? Yeah, I, I, so I've written a lot about the development of the healthy self-concept. I mean, this is our work as a collective. This is so much of our work. We've been so shamed and shunned and diminished and all the rest of it. So I think there's a lot of things you can do, you know, uh, achieving things that, and actually I'll put up a, a piece I wrote about this on my Facebook after we're off for, for that person, anybody else who's interested that talks about three tools. And in my new book, Articulations, I've included that piece. Um, one of the things I found interesting, apart from finishing things that I start, which helped me to prove to myself that I had value and I could see things through, was doing anger work in the somatic psychotherapeutic work. Because what I found is that my inner child didn't have a sense of its own value because nobody had ever defended it. So the more I could assert my healthy anger in my therapeutic process and ultimately in my life, not in a misplaced aggression way, but in a very healthy and assertive, clearly boundaried way, you begin to show your inner child that you're there to protect it, which inherently means that it actually has worth. It's worthy of that protection. And I think the desacralizing of anger in the spiritual world and in the culture at large is one of the biggest mistakes we've ever made. But because if you can't find the fire of justified rage, I mean, apart from the fact that we'll never change the world as activists without it, as individuals, if you can't engage that thread of consciousness, on some level, you're like a bird with one wing. You can cry, but you can't rage. You know, you can grieve, but you can't howl. Um, and I think it's essential to be able to find your fuck you if you want your inner child to know that it matters so that you can move into a place as a healthy adult, realizing also that you matter. Yeah, absolutely. My fuck you saved me. If I hadn't said fuck you as a kid, I wouldn't be doing the work I'm doing in the world right now. If I hadn't learned how to really hone that, develop that and direct that properly, I would never be able to manifest in these ways. It's absolutely essential. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, uh, it's been 
a pleasure, Jeff, to, to, to talk to you. Mm -hmm. But um, I would like to know if there's anything you would like to add that we haven't mentioned yet to the conversation. Yeah, I would say if you're somebody who's interested in the relationship between, say, spirituality and psychology, how this all comes together, the way that I like to think of it is, is I call it Western consciousness, that our work is to marry or bridge our quest for a unity consciousness field, um, our, the oceans of essence, let's say, with the individualized droplet of meaning. So if we go too far towards oneness, away from the localized self, we're lost. We're floating, we're not grounded. If we go too far towards the self, we become narcissistic and aren't aware of a more unified field. That so much of the work and the work in the body is to find that bridge between the localized self and the real why we're here, which usually has something to do with a horizontal movement towards the world at large. And, and to try to hold both of these, and so much patriarchal spirituality has led us so far away from the localized self that there is no self anymore. They're not even in their bodies. So we want to come into our bodies, but not in a way that's completely self-absorbed, but in a way that keeps asking the question, what does it mean to be here? And why am I here? What is my purpose in relation to the world in this lifetime? And I think if we can hold all of that at one time, we're moving in the right direction. Perfect. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Jeff, for thank you. being here for the conference. Um, where can we find you, Jeff? Because a lot of people are asking, like, where can we find you and yeah. references right. and so on. So jeffbrown.co um, is my main site now, soulshapinginstitute.com. My film uh, about Bhagavan Das and Ram Das, Sean Korn uh, was in it as well, uh, karmageddonthemovie.com. My publishing website is in realment.com. Um, and my Facebook main page is facebook.com slash soulshaping. And I'm Instagram, I think I'm Jeff Brown's soul shaping on Instagram. So you can, you can find me everywhere. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so and let me just say one more thing. My new, my new book, Articulations, which is one of my, my fourth book of quotes, is coming out now in the next couple of weeks. Oh, uh, and Grounded Spirituality is super active now. It really speaks to these times. So it's got a wonderful book forward by the brilliant Andrew Harvey that's worth checking out also. Um, and yeah, it's that, that. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much, Jeff. Thank you. Um, so before we finish, uh, I just need to um, mention that this uh, session would be available for two days, 28 hours uh, for free. But if you want to watch again and uh, watch other sessions after the conference, we have a special offer for uh, today. Um, to buy the recordings um, and uh, after tomorrow I think it would be a normal price. Another thing would be uh, the next session is a keynote session uh, and then you will have on the leadership channel Betsy Murphy. Um, Jeff, a top tip for being embodied. Do you have anyone? How do just, suggest light just, just work on feeling your feet. Let's just start with feeling your feet. Yeah, absolutely. So simple. Yeah. Mm. Uh, thank you very much, Jeff, again. Uh, thank, thank you, everyone, thanks, for everybody. watching. And uh, looking forward to talk to you another time. Okay. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, well, If you like that, you'll probably like embodimentunlimited.com and our app. Um, so on both of these things, you can get a bunch of podcasts that aren't available here and some exclusive ones with some big names some people you'll probably recognize that are over there. Um, there's um, a copy of my book, PDF, my first book on embodiment, which uh, seems to have people like. I've sold quite a few copies on Amazon, but there's a free copy there. Um, what else is there? Loads of videos of me coaching embodiment, resources on trauma, on meditation, on yoga. And you can also chat to people without going on Facebook or any of that nonsense. Um, so if you want to chat embodiment with people, that's there. And it's on the embodimentunlimited.com, all free, and the app available at the App Store and all that good stuff. So if you like this, do check those out.